Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth session of the Sustainable Development Transformation Forum, organized by the UN Office for Sustainable Development and the Asia Europe Foundation. This is a series, an annual series of uh, fora that has been going on for several years now. Uh, this year, because of COVID-19, it is a virtual forum. Um, and um, its topic is building back better and greener from the pandemic. And its focus in particular is on the prospects for and the challenge of sustainable low carbon industrialization in low and middle income countries who have yet to have an industrial transformation or takeoff. How can they go about it? Uh, how can it be as, as sustainable as possible? How can it benefit as many of their citizens as possible? <clears throat> so we've talked about financing, we've talked about partnerships, we've talked about policies, trade policies, industrial policies, uh, human development policies as a basis for creating the conditions for takeoff, if you will. It's an old term, but still seems apt. Uh, but in this session, we want to take a deeper dive into a few industries which are either already emerging or have the potential for rapid emergence in low income countries, low and middle income countries, particularly, but not only in Africa. Given demographic trends worldwide, Sub-Saharan Africa is set to have the fastest growing urban population in the world over the coming half century. And if the countries of the region manage to resume strong growth in their recovery from COVID, then there will also be a rapidly growing demand for new housing, commercial buildings, and an associated demand for building materials. The same trend is likely to characterize developing countries elsewhere experiencing rapid economic growth and urbanization. Thus, they are likely to be the epicenter of demand growth for construction materials in the coming decades. Thus far, industries like steel and cement have made only modest progress with decarbonization, given the difficulties of phasing out processed coal if, as may be expected, Africa and other parts of the developing world are the next frontier for the growth of these industries, then it is to be hoped that the new construction materials industries emerging in Africa and other developing countries would be able to leapfrog to the latest production processes as they are developed and maybe even help in the development of them. Partnering with the international technology leaders in joint ventures or through other foreign direct investment may be expedient to enable these countries early on to establish materials processing industries based on as low carbon as possible, clean production technologies, process technologies. And of course, um, the great uh, hope is that the emerging middle classes urban dwellers of Africa and the rest of the developing world will find they have decent housing in which they can live and raise their families and, uh, and feel safe and, uh, and uh, secure from uh, natural disasters. Agro-processing industries have played a role in early industrialization of a number of emerging economies historically. So we're also going to be looking at agro-processing, Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, even Taiwan all started their industrialization uh, with agro-processing as an important component. And these industries, agro-processing industries, currently play a prominent role in some of the dynamic African economies. As with coffee and leather, leather products in Ethiopia, yesterday we heard about the first shoe factory in uh, Ethiopia and tea, horticulture, and dairy in Kenya, and other examples. And they have the potential to emerge to support modernizing agricultural economies in many other countries. Food processing will be an important sector to support the rapidly growing 
middle class urban populations of Africa and their living standards, they're improving living standards. Building strong domestic food and other agro-processing industries can provide valuable support to food security and bolster employment and incomes. Building sustainable processing industries can ensure that agro-industrial development is consistent with tackling climate change, conserving biodiversity, and also protecting oceans and their resources in the case of fisheries. We had hoped to have someone speak about fisheries, but unfortunately that person at the last minute couldn't make it. So we're gonna have a, an excellent panel today and I'm going to introduce them one by one. Um, but maybe I actually will introduce them all at once because I've given them a set of questions. I won't read the questions this time, although I have the last few days. I'll let them just answer the questions as they speak, but I'll, I'll introduce briefly the panelists and then we'll get started. Uh, the first speaker will be Mr. Antonio Carillo, Head of Climate and Energy Program of Lafarge Olsim Limited, which is a major international cement and building materials company, one of the leaders in the world. Um, and he'll speak about the building materials, construction materials industry, and what his company is doing in developing countries. Then Mr. Nicholas Mainling, Principal Advisor for Regional Cooperation for Sustainable Management of Mineral Resources in the Andean region for the German Development Cooperation Agency, GIZ. And he'll speak about um, mineral supply chains and how to make them um, more sustainable, what has been happening in Latin America, the Andean countries, and its lessons for the rest of the world. And then Mr. Santiago Alba Corral, Director of Climate Resilient Food Systems at the International Development Research Center, which is uh, an arm of the Canadian government and Canadian Development Cooperation in Ottawa, Canada. Um, and he will talk about um, uh, resilient agricultural systems um, and how to make those systems more resilient to adapt to the changes expected with climate change. Um, how governments can support farmers, how private sector and nonprofits can support farmers in making those adaptations uh, and also in making their agricultural systems more climate friendly generally. Um, and Mr. Clemens Grunbuhl is Senior Research Fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute based in Bangkok, their bank, the regional office in Asia. Um, and he'll look at his work in the Asian region with building resilient, sustainable agricultural systems uh, in some of the lower income countries in the region uh, to support food security and sustainable livelihoods. So without further ado, I now pass it to Mr. Antonio Carillo to give his presentation. Mr. Carillo. Thank you, David. Um, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, now I think I can share my screen. Um, if this works, let's see technology. Can you... Can you see that? Yes. Fantastic. So once again, uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, an honor. Um, I'm originally from Spain, working in Switzerland, but uh, nevertheless, very passionate about sustainability. So very quick intro about Lafarge Olsen. We're global leader of uh, building uh, um, uh, materials and solutions, but mainly active in four segments, cement, um, as. Uh, David mentioned, uh, obviously with aggregates, uh, we're producing also ready mix and concrete. And, and there's a fourth segment where we do roofing, uh, precast, mortar, and any other innovative solution uh, that helps to, to build uh, uh, in a more sustainable way. Uh, active in more than 75 uh, countries, uh, 70,000 employees, um, I think we cover all geographies. Uh, so I'll try to give uh, an overview today on what we do around sustainability. Uh, with focus on on, on uh, building materials and and the last bit on uh, some activities that we are running currently in, in Africa. Um, I think just wanted to bring some some couple of facts. So concrete is is nowadays the the second most used material uh, in the world after water. That's that's huge. Uh, in the world after water, um, we're building 
apparently it's a, a new york city is being built uh, every month um to address uh, uh housing needs uh, but still 1.6 billion people lack adequate housing so we are obviously being influenced by all the mega trends um, the demand of sustainable construction <clears throat> the, the growing urbanization the population growth moving to to, to big cities um and the increase in living standards. So we, we believe uh, our services and products are bringing value to these needs, but, but we also acknowledge the, the environmental challenges, mainly that, uh, that these services and products are actually causing. No? So, uh, I mean, let, let, let's, let's be frank, cement is uh, responsible for around 6% of the global emissions, and apart sourcing is the largest uh, cement manufacturing uh, company in the world. So we, we take this uh, responsibility very seriously. Climate is at the center of the sustainability uh, uh, strategy, the company strategy. We, we tackle four main sustainability pillars, uh, being climate uh, and energy, as mentioned, to reduce the footprint of our uh, operations, but also the products and services we, we commercialize. We do it through circularity, uh, uh, circular uh, economy measures, uh, avoiding extraction of raw materials, uh, replacing with waste derived resources, both uh, for the for the construction uh, uh, process, but also the fuels we consume. Uh, we tackle the environment mainly focus on water withdrawal and, and air emissions, and, and we try to be active in the communities where we operate as a, as a good employer. Um, but Let's let's bring back the topic of climate. I could not avoid it. That's my field of expertise. Uh, if if you uh, prefer some other topic, you should have brought someone else. Um, I'm the CO2 guy, and 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 I just wanted to express what is the challenge of our industry. Uh, and like many others, more than 70, uh, 75 percent of our footprint is coming from uh, our direct emissions. So. Um, depend on us is uh, is not a scope three value chain it's actually us who are emitting and actually 50 percent of the whole footprint is coming from from the process to from the chemical process to produce clinker which is the the intermediate product before uh having cement so, so basically we need to heat up limestone uh uh around 1300 degrees to produce that clinker and in the process the chemical process that that uh, temperature uh, produces we we emit CO2, uh, and so it's a challenge because it's actually <clears throat> totally linked to our production, and and that's why we we've taken this this very seriously, and 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 um, we've recently joined the the business ambition 1.5 um, with science based target. Uh, I have to 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 um, kindly disagree with David. I think the sector at least uh, we've done a, a, a huge progress uh, since the 90s on reducing our footprint, but it's still long way to go. So, so Lafarge Sosim, uh, around September 2020, joined this business ambition for 1.5 with, with a focus to reduce, to decarbonize to net zero. We've partnered with SBTI to help us build that roadmap. Uh, how does it going to look like? But we wanted to have intermediate targets by 2030. Um, these are the most ambitious targets uh, among international peers and, and currently we're already leading in the intensity. So. Our CO2 emitted per ton of cement is the lowest among international uh, peers, but we know it's not enough and we need to continue to reduce. So th that's a little bit the pathway for, for CO2. We, we have ambition. Uh, we, we, we try to tackle all SDGs, but uh, in terms of materiality aspect, I think climate um, it's, it's, uh, it's probably among the, the most material ones. Um, how are going to, to reach it? I think that will probably be a one hour discussion, but I just wanted to bring you a, a very quick overview of our main decarbonization levers. Um, circularity is going to be a key factor. So we will continue to replace this clinker, this uh, CO2 intense soup product by, by other materials, uh, waste derived resources from other uh, industries. Uh, and, and pushing for low carbon cements and concretes uh, even is not always easy because of the existing standards into the markets. Uh, renewable energy, our scope two emissions from electricity, we, we're moving towards uh, renewable uh, uh, electricity as, um, as everyone else, I guess, uh, with a particular aspect that our facilities are, um, are a great land for, for uh, energy producers to, 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 to build these power purchase agreements. So we are having solar farms, wind farms in the, in the quarries, in the cement plants, uh, to, to not only uh, power our facilities, but also give back to the grid. Um, doing some efficiency, some innovation on the 
plans, uh, how, how they run, uh, but, but mainly on the products, uh, uh, that's what I wanted to come. It, it's, it's really about accelerating all these green products and moving away from the traditional cement and concrete uh, that is in the market. Last but not least, uh, uh, it's a no-brainer that the industry will not be able to decarbonize fully without the uh, full-scale implementation of carbon capture. Um, for that, we are running a, a, a bunch of pilots, uh, um, mainly in Europe and North America. Um, but it's true that this, this is not going to work. Uh, we, we're doing our best, uh, we're pushing the boundaries, uh, um, moving ahead of competitors, but, but there will be some net zero pathway enablers that the society will also need to, 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 to help us with. Um, carbon price is going to be key, not carbon price in Europe, uh, but carbon price worldwide, uh, level playing field. So, so uh, CO2 uh, intensity doesn't move to, to emerging markets, but, but stay global as, a, as, a, as an enabler to decarbonize. The market demand uh, to scale of, uh, of those low carbon products, which are already available in the market, but, but not, not largely deployed uh, because of certain standards still for infrastructure, you need to use this type of, uh, of a specification. We need to move ahead on those uh, construction standards. Uh, for carbon capture, there will be requirements of infrastructure and networks, uh, uh, but it's, it's a great ecosystem that is growing. We're very much excited about it. And, and obviously competitive and uh, uh, enough uh, renewable energy to, to, to run the process. So this, this brings a little bit to, to the probably most exciting part is the, the, the green products, what we call, uh, how we call them, that we have today. We have recently launched this EcoPact. is is a is a green is is a it's a low carbon concrete, uh, at least thirty percent lower carbon content, mainly on on the clinker content than the average in the market. We have this Susteno, which um, was uh, born here in, in Switzerland due to uh, uh, actually uh, helping uh, on, on on policies. So, so um, the, the city of Zurich. Uh, uh, had a mandate to have a, a, a minimum percentage of renewable uh, demolition waste content in the in the cement. So it helped us to bring this this fantastic brand. So specification change we could produce, and now we're expanding uh, to to other geographies. Um, the 3D printing buildings, which is which is coming, and and up to 50% less CO2 just just for the design on how you actually build in the the, infra, the, the, the structure. So for example, imagine uh, with a form. Uh, this sort of a structure would have been like like uh, uh, full, uh, and with 3D printing, we can really reduce the, the amount of material we are uh, we need to 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 produce those structures. And as mentioned before, co-processing, reusing waste. Um, it, it maybe that doesn't come across, but but uh, we are one of the largest waste derived resources consumers uh, in order to 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 decarbonize on on, on the footprint. So so. The, this is probably the the uh, most um, high high level uh, aspect on the decarbonization. But uh, I've I've been asked to provide a, a, a deep focus on on Africa, and and then I was thinking, what what do I what, what can we bring in Africa? Found this fantastic story of fourteen trees. Uh, so let, let let me tell you how this started. This was a, a trainee back in the day sitting in Paris. Um, in Malawi, the main building uh, element was the the, the fire brick. The, the clay brick, the fire brick, the, the clay brick, and and Malawi was facing a, a challenge of uh, deforestation because in order to 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 cook them, you basically they were cutting trees to, to as fuel. No? So so the, the, this dura brick came up uh, is is the is the the, the building uh, the brick that we are producing now made out of soil, uh, mixed with a little bit of cement, uh, water, and sand. And, and it doesn't need to be to be cooked, it doesn't need to be fired, just cured. Um, and, and the name of 14 trees came because, and, and the name of 14 trees house for, with the normal uh, fire uh, bricks, you probably will cut an average of 14 trees to, to, to build it. So with this new building construction element, we're saving 14 trees. Um, the, the, the solution was there. We were missing the financing to scale it up. Uh, it was a fantastic story with the UK government uh, joint venture to, to, to provide this, uh, this process. And, and now it's, it's being deployed in, uh, in, in Malawi uh, uh, with, with few plants. Uh, we expand into Kenya and already internally uh, discussing in other geographies uh, in, in a country where we operate mainly in Africa, Middle East and, and Asia. 
Um, it's a it's a it's a fantastic story. Uh, we we also covered the the microfinancing uh, uh, aspect of the of the deployment of the house. Uh, it's, it's not only about uh, about the, the the struggle to um, uh, with the deforestation, but also the the challenges uh, in Malawi we're facing with the cost of housing. So it is a component of affordable housing, very strong. Um, we're able to deliver this one bedroom home uh, in, in 12 weeks uh, for less than 20,000 uh, uh, US dollars, uh, which is uh, uh, much less than, than the average for, a, for an equivalent house. Um, and we are in discussions with, uh, with uh, local partners uh, for, for this credit offer. Um, in addition, uh, we generate in CO2 credits out of it. So, so I think the, the, the story is fascinating. For, for, we were approached by, by gold standards because for each, for every 120 bricks that we were uh, selling, we're saving one ton of CO2 compared to the, to the normal uh, barn bricks construction. Uh, so, so we are now certifying those credits and we are selling them uh, in the market. Uh, we are not using these offsets to, to decarbonize our inventory. Uh, we're not offsetting, but we're using this to finance, uh, to scale up uh, this initiative in the region. And, and I think this is, is fantastic. Uh, uh, so far, we would have compensated uh, close to 13,000 uh, flies to, to Zurich uh, uh, going back now with the COVID. Uh, that's, that's impossible even to think. But uh, I think it's a fantastic story. And it brings me to the, to, to the other innovation we are deploying nowadays in, in Africa, which, uh, which I briefly mentioned is about this 3D printing. Um, in November, and everything is quite fresh, to be honest, uh, we, we pioneered uh, uh, this 3D printing construction in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it looks like this when, when the printer is actually doing the work, but it, but it looks much cooler when, when, the, when the, the bill is, uh, is, uh, is totally done. Um, so this 3D printed house are now part of our offer uh, to NGOs uh, and, and the low middle class in, in, in Malawi. We're expanding this also uh, to other geographies uh, in the region. Um, it's affordable, uh, but more importantly, it's quick. It's quick and uh, there, there's, there's a very nice uh, concept I wanted to share with you is, is about the, the lack of uh, um, uh, schools uh, in the region. And, and there were some estimates about um, um, in order to cover all the, the school set needs uh, in Malawi would have, uh, a normal construction process would have taken about 70 years. Uh, with this technology, and we've already proven uh, uh, it, it works, uh, we, we can build those schools uh, in, in 10 years. Um, so, what I, I mean, I guess this is this is just uh, an example of, of all the innovations that are being deployed uh, in regions like Africa. Everyone thinks that probably all these uh, green concrete uh, innovative products are being deployed mainly in Europe, uh, North America. That's not true, but, but what, what it's a fact is that we need uh, those enablers, the, the, the wider adoption of those um, low carbon and circular um, materials in the markets. Um, and I think with this, David, I'm going to stop and, and probably let my colleagues to continue and um, being able for questions later on. Okay, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation, Antonio. Um, let me try to see if we have any uh, questions for you. Okay. Um, so we have. Um, Okay, we have one question here from someone in the audience. Um, first, congratulating Jose Lafarge Olsim, saying wonderful work to reduce carbon footprint has been made as shown in your slide. Um, there was a large, a sharp decline in carbon emissions from cement in the 2000s. Can you explain why this sharp decline happened? What triggered it? I think I think so. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Well, probably the graph is also it's also a bit tricky because the, the timeline is squeezed. Uh, but but uh, the, the, I think I would say there are two, uh, but, but, uh, two main factors that influence the decarbonization of, of cement. I'm now talking about cement uh, so far since the 90s. No, uh, there's a there's a uh, old story or, or, or uh, 
heritage from um, from this company, Lafarge and Holcim, uh, in the past were both founding members of the WBCSD, the World Business Council Sustainable Development for for Cement, uh, and and initiated this CO2 road, roadmap uh, together. Uh, the first one was to replace uh, all technologies. That there are two main technologies for cement. It's a waste, uh, wet based uh, production, which is very high, it's, it's not efficient at all in terms of energy. So it emits a lot of CO2 to produce uh, volumes. Uh, th those were uh, historically replaced uh, by, by huge investments uh, into new technologies, new plants, dry plants. Uh, that's probably the main uh, drivers since the 90s. And then the introduction around the, the early 2000, late 90s of the co-processing. So replacing in order to reach a temperature in our kilns uh, that I mentioned that it's required to, 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 to convert limestone into clinker, we need to, we need to heat it up. Uh, we need to consume fuels. And historically that those fuels were, was been uh, coal, pet coke, uh, wet available gas. Uh, but this is probably a newer uh, technology, and and this this consumption of fuels to reach those temperatures are being replaced to to consume alternative fuels. So uh, biomass that cannot be used in other applications uh, being now uh, pumped into the kiln uh, to to replace the energy needs. And and uh, this technology ramp started to ramp up on the, in the I would say late uh, 90s, uh, early to 2000, and that's probably the the replacement. And the fact that that now markets accept. Uh, lower clinker uh, cement, uh, and this is something that has to continue. So, um, uh, you know, uh, like, like here in Switzerland, Europe, uh, mainly uh, uh, standards uh, evolving, environmental product declarations, CO2 footprints being more transparent, and then having products that have less uh, clinker in the content. Those have been the main three uh, aspects that help us reach those, those decarbonization levels. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, just a follow up question on that. Um, um, does the low, lower clinker content of cement um, uh, reduce its resilience or its, um, shall I say, uh, resistance to extreme stresses? Um, and I, the reason I ask is, uh, I don't know to what extent, um, you know, in developing countries in particular, with climate change, there will be increased stresses from flooding, from hurricanes, typhoons, etc., that need to be withstood by housing. And, and, you know, how will that happen if indeed the cement is no longer as strong as it once was, or is it as strong as just strong in a different way? Yeah, no, no, look, it, it's a, it's a, um... Uh, I'm probably not even uh, technical enough to, to give you an explanation. So, so eventually you, you build with concrete, right? And then concrete has uh, many specifications, strength at uh, a number of days. Uh, this these, uh, depends on the clinker content and, and the requirements depend on the standards. So you, you, can, you can build uh, in a more secure way easily uh, and still comply with the strength uh, um, uh, and, and weight needs of, of infrastructures or even housing. Um, but but it requires a little bit of an adoption of those uh, of those uh, standards in the, in the in the in the market, and and also a better use of the of the building material. So for example, you don't need the same concrete to build a foundation of a building, than to probably uh, add a couple of, of bricks together, right? So so in in that case. Uh, uh, we need to be more specific on the applications to be able to uh, reduce or, or to not misuse high strength uh, concrete with uh, with high uh, uh, clinker content for applications that probably we don't need. But when it comes to a construction, probably it's easier to have the same the same pot uh, and then supply it to different. You see what I mean? So I think oh, building building uh, miners are going to be evolving. Uh, products will be more customized for applications. And this will definitely help a lot to reduce this uh, intensity, to be more specific to, to the needs and, and definitely uh, build more sustainably. Great. Okay, thanks. And we have a question. By the way, the earlier question, it turns out, was from Sophie Morgan, I, I realized, uh, the first question. Um, this question is from uh, Raymond Sané. Uh, why are you not selling the CDM credits that your production process generates? 
I think you explained that, but please explain again. No, we, we, we sell them. We sell them to, well, it's, it's something very new. It happened, uh, I think we got the certification, if not in December, November, 2020. Uh, what, we, what I mentioned we don't do is, when I present you our uh, CO2 reduction, you know, some, some companies are offsetting and buying these credits to, to decarbonize or to, to compensate their emissions. Right. We, we're, not, we're not compensating our emissions. We are reducing our emissions by the means that I explained. Uh, those credits that generate the, the, the commercialization of Durabric in 14 trees, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an extra income to, to that project, uh, which requires uh, financing to, to, to grow. So we're using it, uh, you know, you can use that those credits to, to, to deduct it from your inventory of CO2 emissions and, and, and look better. better. Or you can sell them to, to monetize them. And, and we, we opt for the second option. Uh, and I think it's, it's a great, uh, it's, it's great news for, for, for that project to really grow and, and scale up uh, because it needs to reach uh, uh, more countries apart from Malawi and Kenya. And uh, it's, it's going to be a great help. And, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to help also growing because the, the, the more Duda bricks, the more uh, bricks we sell, the more credits we will be generating and, and therefore better financing. So I think affordable housing, where, where in the past probably could have been seen as a CSR activity, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a business, it's a good business and, and it's, it's great that uh, it's also generating those, those jobs and, and helping people to, to live in adequate housing. Right. Okay. You're generating a lot of interest here. We have another couple of questions. Um, I guess I'm good. <laughs> this one is from Nirmali Palewata. Um, is the 3D printing possible only using the materials developed by Lafarge? Um, and she says, congratulations for achieving such meaningful impacts in the low cost housing industry. Well, I should, I should say yes, no, of course. No, I mean, the jokes apart, this 3D printing has been, uh, has been concrete. I think it's, it's been something, it, it, what happens with affordable housing, there are many initiatives, many, many um, of the formal way of constructing, uh, of building uh, solutions, but they are normally stayed in, in a startup niche or, or, or very, very small applications. So this 3D printing, 3D printing with, uh, is, is not new, it's been being tested for, for years. What is new is the deployment, having the scale to, to put it in the market, to, to, pu to push for it and to, uh, and to have the network to, to commercialize it. But uh, I, I guess you can do with all the materials. You just need concrete and a, and a printer. Um, uh, but I think the beauty is really to, to package it into this uh, affordable housing uh, um, spectrum of, of uh, requirements that that region specifically need uh, because of the cost of traditional uh, construction. Right. Good, good. Um, I, I have a question. I, I, um, it has to, before I come to the next question, it has to do again with the credits um, that you uh, sell and then reinvest in the projects. The credits are coming from, from what? From uh, avoided deforestation from cutting trees for uh, using wood or are they coming from changes in the process using less energy uh, what what are the credits for both both, both. I think well I, I didn't know the credit discussion was going to be so uh, so prominent to be honest it's a, it's a, it's a small amount this is 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 a, uh, it's just a little bit the 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 uh, the cherry on top of the cake, no? But no, th this this is a very small amount of credits because the the the, the operation is still small and growing. Uh, but it actually is being generated by uh, by the avoided emissions of this uh, way of construction uh, mm -hmm. compared to the traditional way of construction in the region, which continue to be uh, the 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 cooked uh, brick, no? So it's for brick. Which, uh, it's substituting for brick. Okay, I see. Okay. For, for which uh, they they continue to to unfortunately cut trees and and and, and that's a main source right. of, of fuel right. to 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 make it to make to bake it. No, so it. I think just removing that energy consumption from the process is uh, it, it's been considered as an alternative. Um, and uh, I think the, the beauty is not that much about the credit generation, but the fact that, that the process is a self generating income to, to grow. And I think that's fantastic because the region, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, 
it's it's quite welcome and, and it's going to work. But but that's that's how I think it works. To be honest, right. I, okay. can, I can bring you more information next time on the credit uh, generation. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. And then we have a question from uh, Mr. Chun Q Park. Uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, question is that you mentioned carbon price is key factor toward net zero. I'm wondering whether cement industries can afford to adopt a high price of carbon in emissions trading market, or I guess a tax for that matter. Um, I expect lots of objections would be raised. Um, I think that's a, a good question because, uh, well, you know why. Anyway, can you answer that? No, I, I, I would disagree. If I understand the question correctly, it means that uh, high price uh, will generate reactions against, uh, no, I think, I think, uh, um, I think the challenge we are facing, uh, not La Farge also, but I guess construction materials uh, in Europe, for instance, where ETS uh, still as well, you can apply, where ETS is, is very strong. Uh, it's it's having an impact price of CO2 today in Europe is around 25, 30 dollars, uh, sorry. And has grown like 200% over the last uh, three, three, four years. Um, what happens is, what we see is probably a threat of, of those materials, those intense building materials being imported from regions like uh, like uh, Middle East Africa, and 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 that the, the concept is 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 not is not quite right because eventually you're basically is you're emitting the CO two somewhere else. So right. I, I think I think the the, the mechanism should should uh, should ensure a, a level playing uh, field. Uh, and, and carbon uh, pricing is, is not about the the the, the high or, or low carbon price, but the the, the system needs to 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 avoid uh, to prevent those uh, uh, carbon leakages uh, to happen. And um, and and to be honest, I think it's uh, it's good. Uh, it generates uh, it, it 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 brings in innovation. It it it, it gets uh, out of the comfort zone and and. Technologies like carbon capture, uh, adoption of low carbon products are not going to happen if, if there is if, if carbon price mechanisms are not in place and are well designed. So I think I think it's the opposite. Right, spoken spoken like a true innovator. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think everybody in your industry is necessarily as innovative as uh, you are, but that's another story, perhaps. Uh, any other questions now, or should we? Um, move on to the next speaker. I think we need to move on. So thank you very much for that. Uh, that was fantastic. And My pleasure. Uh, it's been great. Thanks a lot. OK. Um, so our next speaker then will be Nicholas Mainling. I've already introduced him. So Nicholas, you have the floor, please. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Um, let me try and share my screen. Okay. Can you see it now? Um, just give a second. Not yet. Yes, okay. <clears throat> okay. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot Mark, for the invitation and um, and also for that excellent first uh, first presentation, which I also thought was very interesting. I'm going to focus a little bit more on some of the other materials that are not necessarily as um, well. Let let's say that 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 the that the value chain is a little bit more um, dispersed than some of the construction materials, primarily because uh, you know if you look at at things like cement, um, it's very heavy uh, when you compare it to the price. So oftentimes those industries. Are, are localized, whereas I will focus a little bit on some of um, some of the other materials like copper and lithium that oftentimes you see that that they're shipped around the world before they they end up uh, at the end end user market, let's say. Um, and I will give a, a bit of a of a perspective where I work um, here in the Andean region, um, but you know similar let's say trends uh, can be observed uh, in, 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 in other developing country contexts such as Africa. Um, so to start off with, let me give you kind of a global perspective. Um, and uh, I, I think one important component um, of 
let's say the mining sector is is that the focus is primarily on on how to support the energy transition not only in the developing countries but also very much in the developed world right and so this is a study from the world bank from a couple of years ago that looks at what the energy so, so they, they looked at the demand projections resulting from uh, different uh, scenarios of global warming how quickly you would have to roll out uh, new technologies such as wind power solar power electric vehicles and then based on that made projections of what would be required in terms of minerals and materials so just to give you an example on the right hand side you see the uh, a windmill you can see that it requires 4.7 tons uh, of copper, steel, concrete, rare earth, aluminium. So there are a lot of uh, minerals in it. And then uh, on the left hand side, the two graphs that you see there, um, the first one on the left um, shows essentially the demand in 2050, um, annual demand um, for some of the minerals compared to 2018 production as a percentage. So you see that um minerals such as graphite lithium cobalt indium you know the the, the percentage increase in, in annual demand grows uh, in the hundreds uh, in the case of graphite you know close to 500 percent um this is this is well primarily because of some of the new technologies require these uh, these minerals um, it's important to also note that while you have things like lithium that show a huge increase percentage wise if you look at at, at the tonnage um, increase which is the the middle graph if you like and um, some of the more traditional materials that are already being produced in high quantities uh, increase by a lot so aluminium you would need almost close to six million tons per annum more production to satisfy demand um, uh, copper around 1.5 million so so these these materials or these minerals, um, if you want to produce them, essentially you need a lot, a lot more mining. Um, and so the question becomes, how do you mine uh, in a way that um, that you satisfy that that demand without damaging the environment too much, right? I will, and 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 my perspective here in the region, um, our project is 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 based um, on those five Andean countries that you see there. So our focus is a lot on copper and lithium production because um, you know this is essentially two of the big minerals uh, that are required in the energy transition, and that that, that um, the countries here are leading producers. Um, and and if you look at at some of these statistics especially in the middle in terms of public revenues and and export percentages of the economies they are also very important in the domestic economies of some of the the, the countries here um, now all the way to the left you see the number of mining related environmental liabilities that are associated with that and um, so essentially that is the big challenge right so we need to ensure that the energy transition does not come at the societal and environmental costs where mining occurs. Um, and this is, is a huge challenge, right? Uh, because as you saw in the two slides before, we need a lot more mining, but how do we make sure that, that this happens in a sustainable way, both so, so society-wise, so on the left-hand side, you see protests against mining activities uh, in Arica in Chile in 2018. Um, here, a lot of the the problems, um, especially in Chile and southern Peru, which are very arid, are related to water access and and quality of water access, or that that you don't see uh, disasters uh, and environmental impacts like we saw a couple of years ago in Brazil. Um, you know, the, the the sector has been plagued now with three relative recent and large. Uh, tailing dam disasters, uh, which have lost, uh, caused loss of life and, and loss of biodiversity. So, so that's kind of, I think, the big challenge, if you like. Um, uh, Nicholas, sorry to interrupt, but um, some people are asking if you can show the uh, PowerPoint full screen. Uh, and it says that you need to go into the, the settings and duplicate uh, the the screen okay. to 
Yeah, do you know how to do that? Let me try. Into the display settings and then do. Oh, sorry, you're seeing the wrong one. Yeah. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Thank okay, you. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I okay. thought you were seeing the one that I, that I have on the other screen, but but okay, now it's fixed. So 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 that that's kind of the 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 broader um, backdrop to what we're trying to do here um, with with the project that I'm currently leading here for GIZ um, is to to promote responsible mining practices in the Andean region. Um, we do that through three components, through policies and strategies, stakeholder governance and technology transfer and innovation. Um, and we try and work um, across the different stakeholders, uh, so government, civil society, the private sector and academia. Um, the GAZ component, we, we try and focus a little bit more on the societal and policy issues. And the BGR, which is the, is the Geoscience uh, Institute of Germany, focuses on issues such as tailings dam um, and, and the technical geological components, if you like. Um, and you know, I, I, I will mention to you a couple of um, a couple of areas that we're working in because I think this is very much specific to the question at hand and how to. How to ensure um, that this sector is developed uh, in, a, in a more responsible um, and also green manner. And um, so I'll I'll tackle let's say both issues here, not only the environmental component but also the, the social component. And then, if you like, in the question and answers, we can also uh, dive a little bit deeper into the the, the GHG emissions component, if you like. Um, so one one support that we provide particularly to the governments is trying to think through how 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 to deal with new trends um, and and one thing that has been observed here in the region is that because of covid that rollout of new technologies in the mining sector has been accelerated primarily to stop agglomerations in mine sites um, and you've seen that actually productivity of the sector has increased um, so the, the production levels have not necessarily dropped. And the mining sector is, if you compare it to other sectors, a little bit behind when it comes to the adoption of automation, digital um, technologies. But it is, we're currently seeing a, a very rapid uh, ramp up, also because of COVID and seeing that it's working relatively effectively um, and well, and there is a, a, a larger adoption. Um, this obviously has a positive impact in terms of, um, you know, the, the possibilities of reducing the environmental footprint, but it also uh, creates fear in terms of uh, loss of jobs, change, change of sk skills required. So how to manage that transition is, 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 is very key. What's also a new trend is that um, on the left-hand side, you see different uh, voluntary standards and initiatives that are primarily driven by consumers, end consumers um, and investors, um, which basically certificate the, the copper, let's say, that you produce in the region or other minerals to say, you know, we follow certain standards that are above and beyond um, the national legislations, if you like. What, what is interesting here is that if you look at the consumers and investors, there is a very big focus on GHG emissions. If you talk to local communities where the mining happens, that's probably one of the last priorities that they have on their list of issues that they care about, right? So it's a lot more about, will I have access to water uh, that is clean and reliable? And will I have, um, um, will I have a job and an income? So that's maybe also something uh, to keep in mind for, for the discussion later on. Um, okay, another, sorry, one last request. There's yeah, a, gray, a gray box in on the right side of the screen as we look at your slides. And is that, yeah, there we go. Okay, it's gone. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, then another topic that that very much speaks to you know the industrialization component of of i guess this uh, this this particular session 
is uh, we, we try and support governments in trying to identify the, the linkages to the mining sector. And on the left hand side, you see some of the, let's say, positive potential linkages that the mining sector can have. Um, where the EI project in the middle is the mining project or another extractive industries project. And then you have upstream linkages, which essentially are the suppliers to the sector and the downstream linkages, which essentially are processing plants. Uh, and then if you go further downstream, um, you know, the end product. Um, and one experience that we've had here in the region, in Chile, for example, is that a lot of focus has been placed on the upstream linkages. Um, and, and they've done relatively well in terms of exporting that expertise also to, to other countries in the region. Um, what, what we are also advocating is to um, look at some of these other uh, linkages, especially the spatial linkages, which essentially is shared use infrastructure investments whereby for many mining projects uh, you know you need to invest in large scale infrastructure such as electricity water infrastructure um, transport infrastructure so how to structure these investments to make sure that they both benefit the project itself but also um, benefit the, the let's say surrounding communities where 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 the mine is located um, and so I think, and because often when you talk about industrialization, the focus is very much on downstream linkages. Um, in many of the assessments that have been done in the mining sector, oftentimes this linkage um, is, is very difficult to materialize. Um, and it's also questionable whether that's the best approach in terms of creating a lot of jobs um, and 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 whether you know th th there is a trade-off because you probably have to subsidize um, in order to attract that downstream let's say first linkage um, and and so the question arises does it make sense to focus more on other linkages rather than just focusing on the downstream linkage when when thinking about uh, industrialization strategies out of of the mining sector um, the second component um, that we focus on is stakeholder governance. Um, so this is promoting multi-stakeholder dialogue, effective complaint mechanisms, and particip participatory decision making. Um, one example or one work that we're doing is working very closely with the ombuds institutions, also to try and see how to how to integrate. Uh, human, the human rights perspective into the, the environmental impact assessments of mining projects so that, they are, that, that there is a more participatory approach uh, to the decision-making process where the mining activities happen. And then on the technology transfer and innovation pro promotion, um, so one key component there is actually de decarbonizing the mining process. Um, this and 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 this is something where where Chile is actually quite leading uh, along with uh, maybe Australia uh, and Canada. Um, there 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 is very high radiation here in northern Chile, um, and so you see mining companies increasingly um, sourcing their energy from renewable um, power plants. Um, this is uh, the, the picture on the left is the Pampa Evida solar thermal plant, uh, which is used for the electro winning process of, of Coderco. And there are many more examples uh, in the region. Um, this is, I think, uh, also because, David, you asked me in your questions, what are some of the lessons learned for, for other developing countries? I think this is something where, where Chile is, is, is very advanced. Um, I will skip uh, this particular slide um, because I think it's a little bit res less relevant for our conversation um, right now um, and, and leave a couple of key messages. Um, so, so first of all, the energy transition is very mineral intensive as shown in, in my first slide. Um, and we need to ensure that the energy transition does not come at the societal and environmental expense where mining occurs. So this is for copper uh, and, and lithium here, the Andean region. For cobalt, um, it's, it's in, in, in the DRC. Um, so 
this kind of trend uh, and, uh, and and problem, um, if you like, um, as well as an opportunity, um, is cross-cutting in, in developing countries, right? Um, and, and I think it requires uh, new technologies to minimize the environmental footprint of mining. And there, I think actors such as ourselves can help um, steer through that together with governments and, and also um, the private sector. Um, because oftentimes these new technologies not, don't only come um, with, with positive impacts, but can also lead to backlash, um, especially in mining regions if people feel um, that, that you know, they will lose uh, their, their income and their livelihoods. Um, and it requires a territorial strategy and inclusive approaches uh, to avo avoid uh, not in my back backyard backlash, which you're seeing in many mining jurisdictions, right? Particularly if um, if new technologies are implemented that reduce uh, the employment at the local level where mining happens, um, we need to think of new approaches to ensure that these communities benefit in one way or another. Um, and I think here, um, you know, this this territorial approach where you, you look at the linkages, not just um, through direct employment, but also through what are the supplier opportunities, uh, what are the opportunities to, for example, provide water to communities due to the investments of mining infrastructure um, or similar energy? Uh, yeah. So one of the uh, one of the issues we've studied in in this uh, in the study that I showed you, the renewable power of the mine, was to look at how to provide renewable uh, power to communities that may be in very remote regions near to near to mine sites. Um, so I'll stop there um, and 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 jump into into any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so let's see here. Um, I don't see any immediate. Wait a second. Here we are. Something's getting mixed up here. Um, question to Mr. Menling. Thanks for the presentation. Um, what about policies and projects towards a circular economy in mining? Um, for example, creating an industry to extract minerals from existing items to reuse in new items. Um, I don't know if you have any yeah. experience or thoughts yeah, no. on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so the, the figures that I showed you right at the beginning, um, they take recycling into account. Uh, and, and certainly, like, the efforts uh, to recycle and reuse materials um, is, is growing. Um, this is not so much... I mean, if you look at the Andean region, there are efforts to um, basically remine mine waste that previously... You know, the, a lot of a lot of a lot of the time in the tailings dams, there is still leftover mineral minerals and metals that, with new technologies, you can remine to take out to, to be, essentially get out more metals. Um, but a lot of the circle, circular economy discussion uh, is is from a developing country, demand driven. So it's primarily in the United States uh, or in the North America, in Asia, and and in Europe. Um, and so, from a from a producer perspective, it's it's you know because a lot of the end user demand is not necessarily here; it's exported. Um, so the efforts here in the region are, as I mentioned, looking at uh, recycling, essentially more recycling than the true sense of of circular economy. And the efforts in the Western world um, of recycling were included. In, in, in the projections that I showed you on the first graph of the slide. Uh, so even if you have high levels um, of, recy of recycling, you still need uh, a very large proportion of additional materials uh, in order to implement uh, the energy transition. Right, okay. Uh, that was from Sophie Morgan. And now we have a question from uh, 
Uh, no, this is for Mr. Carillo. I don't know if uh, he's still there. Um, um, but anyway, <clears throat> I think he's left, so sorry. No, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, so we have a question for you. Um, is the 3D printed house, does the 3D printed house material allow for um, transformation to be made easily using low technologies by the users, the house owners, after some time? I don't know whether transformation means uh, improvement, expansion, upgrading. I suppose that's what is meant. Uh, yeah, I don't know either, uh, but let me let me try to 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 make an answer on what I understand. Well, I, I guess it's about uh, now that the printer is a is a big uh, it's 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 quite um, tedious to move. So uh, once you mean you, you need some some time to prepare the the process. So I I can imagine that this uh, will uh, will evolve and uh, over time, concrete three D printers will be more. Uh, uh, manageable or manageable in an easy way, probably lighter and uh, I wouldn't say low tech, uh, but but technology will be more common for sure. Okay, so she she uh, explains what she has in mind. Uh, for example, adding a window, punching a window, as she puts it. Um, so I guess renovation uh, with new features like adding windows and such. Um, I guess the question is how malleable, how how can you work with the material? Is it is it possible to work with it and uh, modify it, uh, or is it pretty much um, you know you get what you you start with? No, well, look, this is concrete, right? So uh, you can you can cut uh, you, you you can. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't say easy that you can do it in your own home. Uh, I don't know how the future will be to cut concrete, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, ideally, you need to have a good planning, a good design now, and obviously you can do you can do changes afterwards, but it would require some uh, uh, some construction skills, I can, I can imagine, for right. the time being. Right. But that's a good question. I haven't thought about it, to be honest. Um, yeah. It's a good question from Rosa. Okay. Um, so anybody else have any questions um, for uh, Nicholas? If not, uh, maybe David. Um, just coming back to one one topic that you also asked me in your in your yes. in your email, and because it always comes up, is about industrialization downstream, right? Uh, and what are the opportunities of industrializing downstream? Mm -hmm. um, I think so. There, 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 and and the experiences here. So what what's quite interesting is the lithium sector. Um, if you look at the lithium triangle. Um, Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina have taken very different approaches to how they want to use uh, lithium in their industrial policy. Um, Bolivia has been very much focused on, on government-led um, development. Um, Argentina has been very much focused on attracting investors and not requiring the processing of the lithium in-country. And Chile has taken kind of the middle middle approach, whereby there are requirements to process some of the lithium domestically. Um, and if you see the production levels um, in Argentina, you know production levels have risen relatively quickly in recent years. Chile has been relatively stable, and Bolivia has not yet started to um, to develop its salt flats. Of course, this is. Um, and, you know, we, we still don't know how this is all going to develop in a 20 or 30 year time frame, but it's been very complicated for the region to attract, let's say, the cell battery producers to come and, 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 and do some of the more technically advanced work here in the region. Um, most of the lithium hydroxide and carbonate, um, well, all of it actually, um, goes goes abroad, uh, a lot of it to China, um, to South Korea, to Japan, so, and very much focused on, on where the demand is rather than um, being able to industrialize downstream uh, from the sector. Okay, uh, just a question about that and then we'll move on. Um, I mean, presumably exporting the uh, 
lithium oxide you said the hydrate i i don't know the terms because i don't know the processes i'm afraid um but in any case the the processed lithium um presumably that's um a higher weight to value ratio than the batteries um and so I'm, I'm just curious why it makes more sense to export that as it is rather than to produce the lithium batteries and export them from the country that's got the lithium. I, I don't quite know the economics of it, but it doesn't seem intuitively to make sense. Or am I missing something? Yeah, I think, I mean, because the, the as you rightly put, the, the, it has a lot to do with the value to weight ratio. So if you look at cement, you often have cement plants in 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 the countries where the cement is consumed. Um, so the distance between, let's say, extracting um, the inputs for cement and has to be relatively short. For lithium and and for copper and for I mean the the, the other extreme are are diamonds, right? And and like very let's say valuable value to weight ratio is very very high. So the higher that gets, the the less of an economic incentive there is, and 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 the lithium side, um, yeah, the the value to to weight ratio is is still too high to for 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 this to make economic sense to essentially process it uh, at the point of extraction rather at the point of consumption, um, and so other factors such as the expertise and know how uh, and can primarily chemical expertise um, is more important than uh, than transport costs. Okay, so it's the chemical expertise which is more abundant in places like China than in uh, the Latin American countries. Is that is that the basic bottom line? And, and the demand. So, I mean, ultimately, a lot of the, the, the batteries now go into into cars, electric vehicles, right? So they want to be close to the consumer as well. So the expertise and the closeness to the consumer, and I mean, in in also policies, um, I think uh, that that have supported and promoted that sector very strongly in in countries such as China, for example. Right, right. Okay, so industrial policy promotion does play a role, huh? Yeah, I think um, at the cons the consumer countries have. A bigger lever here than the producing countries, you sure, know. Sure, um, sure. Mm -hmm. So, like, if China say, if you want to sell in my market, you need to produce it here. Um, they <laughs> they sit on 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 the bigger lever than than let's say if Chile says, if you want my lithium, you need to process it here. Right. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think that's. The last question we have for the moment, so we'll move to the next speaker. Um, so I'd like to just pass the floor now to Mr. Santiago Albacoral from IDRC. Please, Mr. Albacoral, you have the floor. Thank you again, Nicholas. Thank you, David. No, thank you, Nicholas. Um, uh, let me give a quick highlight of who is uh, IDRC. IDRC is, as, as David mentioned, uh, one, of the, one of the tools of, of Canada to support international development. We're focusing on, on riches for development. The, why we are bringing the conversation around industries uh, in agri agriculture and agribusiness, and in particular on, on, on Africa. Let me give you some figures that I think can help us. Still today, more than 55% of African uh, working forces relies on agriculture sector for livelihoods, for income, for employment, uh, especially in the smallholder family farming. 60-80% of this workforce are still women. So any transformation of agribusiness or food systems should either provide alternative jobs to this 55% or provide enough opportunities within the system of the agri-production, agri or actually better both. The second figure is that food systems globally are responsible of 30% of the global uh, greenhouse uh, emissions. We know and smallholder farmers and in places like South Saharan Africa in particular are not responsible of, of these numbers, but they still 
are going to face and are facing a future market pushing for carbon zero, for a carbon neutral market. That means that all the value chains must prove its carbon neutrality. An example, if Denmark is moving to carbon neutrality by 2030, 2050, every single thing that they consume should be carbon neutral. If they are consuming chocolate, the cocoa that they consume, that they import, needs to continue proving that neutrality. That has a direct impact in the smallholder farmers in Ivory Coast producing this cocoa, regardless of the uh, of the responsibility or not into the the, the global uh, uh, climate crisis. A third element is that the food and production uh, of food and other systems, uh, another, another products we will see is in particular for, for, for um, uh, coffee, for instance, has increased losses connected to climate change. At the same time that we are increasing the demand and many produce many products and increasing population. And they, every losses actual has a huge impact. What we see about the, uh, in, in South Saharan Africa on the, on the uh, national GDPs. For instance, you will reduce in one year 25% uh, of the corn yields in Mozambique, that automatically is a reducing of over 3% of their GDP. There's a fourth element that we are not going to talk in particular today, but I think it's important to, to remember, is that the food systems that we have today are still not providing enough food or the right food. So we are still facing an over around 850 million of food insecure people in the planet and 2 billion people overweight. So the, the transformation of the agribusiness needs, needs also to respond to that, to that crisis. However, agriculture is not only impacting the climate and highly impacted by the climate change, agriculture is one of the few sectors and we will see different, different, different production sectors today that has the potential of to, to putting carbon back to the ground. So any process to transform, any investment, any policy to transform food systems agribusiness has the potential to play this double role of adapting and to mitigate uh, to climate change. Let's go to some examples, uh, in particular for the, some of the uh, uh, cash crops such as such a coffee. Coffee traditionally, uh, and, and some of the varieties has been considered that is more resilient to climate change than other food, uh, food crops. However, we are seeing more and more highest impacts of climate change uh, almost in every coffee production zone. So the hotspots, the climate hotspots that we are seeing actually are aligning to the places where, where coffee or cocoa are producing. And actually the cumulative impact on production is more and more, uh, is highly uh, uh, significant. In a moment, where, for instance, the global demand for coffee is increasing globally. So this has made, uh, this, is, this is pushing coffee, trader, coffee traders and business, uh, coffee business to be really concerned about the future availability of coffee worldwide, it will be similar to cocoa and many other products. So it's been real, the climate change uh, on, on coffee producers. In Africa, farm, coffee producers, coffee farmers have already observe that droughts are becoming longer, rainfall becoming more erratic, erratic, the rains are shorter, and that impacts in key moments of the coffee production for flowering to uh, the, the berry filling stages have an impact in co coffee yields. Additionally, we are seeing that the movement, the changes of temperatures, is, is minimum changes of temperatures are increasing that, uh, and, and changing the, the level of diseases and pests that affect the production. So if we look at that landscape and we understand that coffee or cocoa are sectors that involve large numbers of families that generate jobs uh, and that is actually one of the sectors that is more attractive from an agricultural point of view to young farmers uh, and that actually key uh, minorities, uh, women, ha play a key role in the production. We are going to see that we need to create several adaptation strategies and interventions that needs to be put in place to reduce the impact of climate change. Many of them are going to be, of course, related to the way that we produce. This is going to be the way that we 
create, we find more resilient varieties. We establish uh, agriculture practices that are that are more res more resilient. Um, that we 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 change the renewal of aging plants, uh, agronomic management, integrated pest management, technological solutions. The one of the issues that we are seeing in this one is that these tend to require capital investments, technical support. And, and extension services that are not always available at, this, at the scale that we need in order to transform a full sector. These other aspects that are important to take in consideration when, when policies are going to be implemented around transforming production systems such in agribusiness. Uh, for instance, not only agronomic. Uh, when we look at the climate change mapping and and we we look at the the different scenarios and we we, we see how the areas that are now sustainable for growing most of the, the varieties in, in, for instance, in coffee, are going to be reducing drastically in the future. So that is not only increase the losses estimated that we have been talking in the, and that trans translated to millions of, of US dollar, is that the adapting strategies that we are going to require are going to be completely different. A clear example, the lower altitudes areas appear more and more unsustainable for many of the varieties of coffee. So in the future, with the current practices, using the current varieties with the current water uh, management uh, technologies, we are going to require a, an increase in movement to a different areas. So in Kenya and Uganda, we have estimated that climate change will lead to, to the redistribution of growing um, co coffee growing areas to by up to a 400 meters. So meaning there's going to be a whole expansion with land access control, with in, uh, in, uh, invasive of uh, if, is, um, competing with forestry and natural ecosystems, and that will create considerable socioeconomic political impacts uh, as farmers will have to change their livelihoods. So do we see that it's not only an issue that will have an impact in the production, in the market, in the consumption, but it will create a whole dis disconnection on the, on the, on the existing uh, sociopolitical uh, tensions in many of these countries. At some point, there were some numbers that, for instance, we there were some studies in, in Tanzania that were proving that increasing temperatures of up to a two um, degrees Celsius could increase the productivity. However, when we move those scenarios to the 3.6 degrees, what is right now, and with the reduction of of the rainfall, that automatically becomes limited the, of the places that we can produce uh, coffee of of cacao. So well, challenges of uh, uh, let, let's. So what we can do, and and beyond some of the technological solutions or the agronomic solutions that we have seen, I want to give you an example of uh, uh, that IDRC has been funding in, in Ivory Coast with uh, cocoa producing families uh, and cocoa producing uh, cooperatives. Uh, a key element uh, that we identify is that they have little access to climate information. So without access to climate information. Uh, is difficult to translate and to scale their operations. So what are the difficulties to make informed decisions in a context of changing climate and being threatened by, by not having enough resilient responses to how to produce uh, cocoa? So the solution is promote access to climate scenarios uh, and, and to use different agroecological practices adopted to the specificities of of um, of the local of the local needs the basics is we is increasing the resilience of individuals of communities not only the resilience of the systems many of the responses from agroecology sorry from agro um, agribusiness and and the production of food has been focused on the resilience of the agro production we also need to understand the resilience of communities. So more sustainable uh, uh, co cooperatives and families help to adapt to not only the 
current climate change, but the potential future climate change. And we have seen this, for instance, during COVID, when a different challenge has made that communities that were more resilient to already prepared to understand resilience in a different way have been able to adapt to uh, another challenge or uh, another threat, such as, for instance, the impact of, of COVID and on, or, or the responses to the, to the COVID lo lockdowns. So the working with participatory approaches with farmers, working with th teams of researchers that analyze the agroecological adaptation in different and in different scenarios and creating the practices that are more relevant, combine solutions that allow people to take decisions uh, in the at, the at the real time. So I think that will be a critical element of how we are going to respond. So how do we really adapt and challenge solutions uh, for the future? Uh, the first one is the transforming to more sustainable, more resilient and more inclusive for systems. We require, it will require that we think in how do we produce, how do we market, and how do we consume food? And of course, as I always say, what do we produce? One key element is going to be the access to climate information, understanding and recognition of the urgency of the climate crisis. The second will be the farmers adapting and adopting a collection of practices and technologies and approaches agroecological approaches, more resilient technologies, climate smart agriculture, intercropping, etc. Understanding the trade the trade-offs of these approaches is going to be critical to ensure the success. Under that principle, we need to understand that leaving no one behind and the role of inclusion, the voices of women, the voices of youth, the voices of indigenous groups and minority groups, it will be critical because the transformation, as we have seen, needs to integrate a 50, approximately 55 percent of the population. The role of private, uh, the, the private investment uh, is going to be critical. We have a growth opportunity, a gold opportunity around the climate finance, how climate finances can reach farmers. Uh, what is the role of markets and what is the role of consumers that want to be, and we are seeing already, are demanding already a different way of producing. The urbanization of, of the population is also a critical aspect in, in what are those consumers asking and looking for in their markets and how the smallholder farmers and the middle info, uh, and the agribusiness are able to produce and to market the food that is being required. I think the other thing will be as some, looking at some models. Uh, the, the, for instance, a, an example on the more sustainable uh, coffee productions in Colombia uh, has been the association of coffee producers and the engagement with, with um, um, uh, governments and uh, and, com and uh, corporations around coffee that ensures price stability, that provide technical support, that provide financial support. So, National coffee, cocoa, or other uh, agri agribusiness or uh, uh, food crops uh, need to develop a strategy seeking to improve sustainable, uh, sustainable agribusiness. Production must consider the potential of threat, threat of climate change, the climate variability, and the potential to mitigate. We cannot avoid that need of actually r reaching the 1.5 Celsius will require a transformation of the system that adapts and mitigates to the example. Um, some of the best examples of adapting uh, the, the, uh, the, the agri-industry are being implemented by public and, pub public and private partnerships because they actually have the capacity not only to adapt and to influence and, or, and to inf um, implement some of the of the changes, but implement those changes at scale. Uh, the, the level of the crisis that we are facing will require a response that is at a scale. And the technologies that enable producers to adapt to climate change to be ready for a carbon neutral future. I think that will be critical uh, and the main message problem is that we need to change the, 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 the birth times is not anymore in the future, 
it needs to happen now because the next decade is going to be critical to reach not only the sustainable development goals that will be that was that we all committed to but to be sure that we are prepared to respond to the climate crisis in a way that keeps producing enough and the right food and the right weight for everybody thank you so much uh, david okay thank you very much um santiago and um we are gonna have to move quickly uh to the next speaker but any questions you want to pose to uh mr alba corral before we go to our last speaker anybody in the audience want to pose any questions um there's a question on urban agriculture i don't see it can somebody oh, yeah. read, can you read it out yes i think i see support a lot of recent urban agriculture so far um scale information call organized to respond growing urban towards needs in development countries um yeah i mean i think urban agriculture is going to be as, as i first is 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 one of the tools in the toolbox i think the urbanization of population requires the role of urbanization of agriculture in many in many places i think that the decarbonization of agriculture will will push for a, 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 the proximity of the production to the consumers we are seeing that not only in the global north but also in the global south as an increase i i think there will be elements as well of rethinking how we how we evaluate territories what is what is urban what is peri-urban what will be the pressure on the land uh, i think it's critical in order to push urban agriculture if we want to keep and actually give agricultural land back to forestry in order to reduce and to and to keep putting carbon back to the ground uh, and I think it will be that idea where we are, we, we the, the, the policies, the political environment, the technological um, solutions, and are combining in a, in a way that give access to those, to, those, uh, to those farmers. I think actually the small scale agriculture and is, is one of the places and, and that can, can help in, in, in filling that uh, buffer between the, the, the wide scale big agriculture and connect to, to the consumers. That's what, another element as well, I think, where the push and pull is critical. The, the increasing of urbanization is also increasing for or, or requesting for a model of agriculture that is more sustainable and urban agriculture actually is in a better position in many cases to respond to, to that sustainability. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions or shall we move to our last speaker? I don't see any, so let's... Thank you very much, Santiago. And um, we'll now go to our last speaker, Mr. Clemens Grunbuhl from the Stockholm Environment Institute Asian Regional Office. Mr. Grunbuhl, please. Yes, thank you, David. I'm just going to share my presentation. Okay, good. Uh, can you make it full screen? Okay, great. Thank you. Does it come out okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so thanks very much. I just realized uh, I, I had a I have a bit of a lighting issue, so you only can see half of my face. Um, <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, uh, just very briefly, the Stockholm Environment Institute is an environmental research institute, uh, independent, with its headquarters obviously in, in Stockholm. Um, uh, I am based in the uh, Asia Regional Center. Uh, as David already mentioned, based in Bangkok. And um, it's actually um, a brilliant choreography, David, that uh, you let me speak after Santiago because uh, I think I can pick up um, right where he left off because we, we um, work a lot with smallholders on transforming production systems. And we also work on uh, um, um, sort of improving or advising on uh, sustainable agriculture policies. And what I'd like to do today is to give you a concrete example of uh, what we did in, uh, in, in Laos. 
um, in terms of the green and sustainable agriculture framework. Um, <clears throat> at um, Stockholm Environment Institute, SEI, we uh, we do research, but we do research for a purpose, and which is most mostly uh, uh, to support formulation of evidence-based policy. So this was the case in Laos, and um, on this slide you can see uh, where the transition takes place from uh, uh, where uh, sort of uh, traditional research ends on the left side into how uh, policy is formulated. Uh, on the right side. I won't go into the details here just to let you know that this was a, a long process, a three-year process of formulating the green and sustainable agriculture framework. And before um, those three years, when we started in 2017, there was a lot of research that basically, uh, if I could summarize it, um, uh, um, uh, that, that, that essentially um, and let the the, the, the policy stakeholders know that their assumptions in their agricultural policy uh, were wrong. The, the uh, traditional agricultural policy in Laos was based on two fallacies. One was that the policy targets uh, was based on uh, production targets. So, um, you know, increase of production year by year, and um, some of the research showed that uh, given the uh, geomorphological uh, situation in Laos, those production targets were just simply unrealistic. And also uh, given the, the level of mechanization and technology there. Um, <clears throat> the other fallacy was that um, by producing basic commodities, um, uh, there was never going to be a chance to compete with the much larger and much more uh, productive um, uh, neighboring countries. So Laos is uh, surrounded by Vietnam, Thailand, China, which are some of the largest rice producing areas in the world or the largest rice producing uh, countries in the world. And Laos would never be able to catch up with that. So uh, that sort of necessitated a reorientation uh, of uh, uh, Lao agriculture policy. And um, that was, I think, the window of opportunity that we jumped on um, in order to push the new agriculture policy into a more sustainable uh, direction. So what is the uh, Green Sustainable Agriculture Framework? It's um, basically a, a part of the national agriculture uh, policy. And um, <clears throat> It establishes GAP, good agriculture practice, as the unified national standard across uh, all farms in the country. So GAP is a standard that's uh, promoted by FAO and uh, basically um, um, basically uh, sort of sets a standard for uh, clean, producer-friendly, and traceable, transparent uh, agriculture production. It's not sustainable agriculture. Uh, yet, it doesn't reach that level yet, but it uh, establishes a good standard um, uh, if it's applied across uh, the nation. And then as a second step, um, there would be an exploration into more sustainable production systems. So whether that's agroecological systems, whether that's organic systems, whether that's pesticide-free systems, uh, um, uh, these kind of things um, would be no tillage, for example, these uh, kind of systems would be explored relating to the, um, the, the different locations, the different parts of the countries and uh, the infrastructure that would make those possible. Um, so GAP uh, as a minimum standard and then look at uh, additional option, options of agriculture, agricultural production where that is, uh, where that is possible. Um, so the, the, the GSA is part of a larger national green growth strategy that um, has as its top sort of policy targets, poverty er eradication, preserving natural resources, adapting to climate change, uh, resilience to natural disasters, and healthy and safe food systems. So these are top level national policy uh, objectives. Um, <clears throat> These are some of the principles of the GSA. I'd like to point your attention to, um, 
to uh, the last one, uh, post-harvest storage and processing facilities. So this was also new. We were not only going to look at production systems, but also what happens uh, post-harvest and beyond. Uh, one of the um, insights from previous research was also that uh, most of the production that occurs in Laos, the post-harvest and the, and the processing occurs outside of Laos. So, for example, if you have um, um, uh, uh, corn that's produced in Laos, it is uh, very often exported to Thailand and processed into uh, animal feed and then re-imported into Laos to feed the animals there. So that doesn't make a lot of economic sense and the added value is lost to uh, other economies. Um, this is the scope of the GSA. Um, one notable exception here is um, forestry, uh, especially when it comes to agroforestry and, and uh, innovative models like that. This was excluded. Uh, I would say for political reasons, um, not a lot of transparency in the forestry sector in, in, in Laos, so that was uh, consciously excluded from this policy, which was a shame, but, uh, you know, we work with uh, what we got. Um, maybe to explain just the non-timber forest products, there's um, quite a large uh, amount of production of non-timber forest products, uh, so um, products taken out of the forest that are uh, not related to, um, to to the forestry sector uh, per se. Um, could be hunting, could be uh, wild vegetables, things like that. A large part of the population um, derive their daily diet from non timber forest products. So it's good that that is also included in in terms of uh, producing uh, these kind of food food stuffs in a in a sustainable way. What kind of approach did we choose? Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to, um, again, not going into details too much, but um, I'd like to uh, point your attention to number four, diversified production methods and uh, products. Uh, please keep in mind that uh, Laos uh, is a planning economy and the whole uh, policy and planning uh, uh, sector is sort of very top down. Uh, for them to promote diversified production methods and products is uh, a new thing. So um, that's uh, that's also innovative and it, it gives space for um, innovation related to uh, the level of knowledge, the level of skill, but also the ecological situations where the production happens. And also the last point, improved post-harvest and storage infrastructure. There is a commitment by the government to actually invest in agricultural infrastructure. Um, not only agricultural infrastructure, also general infrastructure like uh, roads, electrification, things like that, but especially um, post-harvest harvest, um, and storage uh, facilities for, uh, for new products. Um, these are some of the standards for uh, good agricultural practice. I don't think I have to go into this uh, right now. Um, <clears throat> But I think uh, what was important, um, not only in terms of sort of environmental preser preservation, but also looking at the green and sustainable agriculture framework as a, an economic opportunity. Uh, if you look at number, uh, point number three, value generation. So the idea here was to um, go into new types of products um, that uh, might be a niche market, but uh, where Laos is well positioned to explore these niche markets because the other um, neighboring countries that produce mostly bulk uh, uh, commodities would not uh, have already sort of um, um, uh, conquered these markets. So um, there are there are um, uh, uh, there are there are ideas that look at uh, different and sort of odd uh, varieties of of rice that are not to be found anywhere else. Um, Santiago just talked about coffee. Uh, coffee has very high potential and there's actually a history of coffee production in Laos, in, in southern Laos, in one particular um, area where there's high altitude, um, where there's been coffee production since the French colonial times. And um, 
uh, this is being relived and, and, and production systems are being looked at uh, to produce uh, more value and go into specialty coffee or organic coffee markets. Um, at the same time, I think uh, last point here is, is the um, uh, need definitely for capacity building and also revamping the whole agriculture extension systems because um, uh, Laos has been built on sort of these uh, traditional policy targets of production increases. Uh, the extension system also needs upskilling in terms of what are the green production methods and how can sort of uh, green production methods, value addition and livelihoods strengthen in can be uh, balanced out. Um, so on the left side here, we have a, a, a number of policy priorities that were sort of given through uh, uh, national policy targets. Uh, we narrowed that down and, and thought, um, this is the second column from the left, uh, what kind of policy action can we put into this uh, policy framework? Um, so ma maintaining agrobiodiversity was uh, one of the uh, at the top of the list because uh, Laos uh, is a very biodiverse uh, country still and also in terms of agricultural commodities a very biodiverse um, uh, 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 country in terms of the commodities uh, offered. Uh, niche markets, um, there's for example high demand by um, uh, China for special types of tea that are not available in China, only in Laos. Uh, and uh, Laos wants to uh, sort of exploit these markets. Um, upskilling, I mentioned that unique products. So geo-indexation is very high on the list. A uh, special type of uh, uh, glutinous rice has already been um, uh, geo index in the, with the um, international certification uh, body, uh, as well as the Bolivian coffee that I mentioned before and the Pusan tea that I mentioned as well. Um, for the first time, I would say um, Laos is inviting private sector investment, not just internally, but also uh, foreign direct investment through the private sector. Um, this is new to a country like Laos, and um, they're actively looking for partnerships. Um, such as was was mentioned earlier, private uh, public private partnerships in uh, sort of um, um, looking at these specialty commodities that come out of um, um, GAP or sustainable agriculture farming. Um, there's still a long way to go, especially the finance uh, mechanisms, coordination across different departments um, and the whole certification process uh, to create this transparency that's really important. Um, and, then, and then bringing this all together in one uh, coherent uh, implementation plan. Those are the next steps that uh, we want to work with the government of Laos and FAO with. Um, I think I'll go through this very quickly. Um, it's a very complex process. Um, the framework that we develop needs to be uh, in line with the different um, national policies, the top ones being the National Socioeconomic Development Plan. This is the five-year development plan that um, uh, uh, you know, the, na the national government gives out. Um, and then secondly, the Agriculture Development Strategy until 20. 2025. Um, those are the main um, policies that we need to follow with this, um, but also link up to um, the regional policy, the ASEAN, uh, given out by the, by the ASEAN, and uh, linking to international policies, first and foremost, obviously, the Sustainable Development Goals and the NDCs. Um, one important part was also that this uh, this uh, strategy or framework was was developed as a, um, a multi-stakeholder uh, process. So it's not just top down through the government, but um, <clears throat> but with private sector, with farmers, with civil society, the civil society that exists in Laos, um, and of course with development partners and research. Um, just finally here, um, we identified in the framework three really important uh, investment areas for uh, green and sustainable agriculture in Laos. The first one was uh, green agriculture innovation um, and technology. So this um, 
this uh, hinges um, on the um, the discussion that we're talking about uh, in terms of low carbon. Uh, one of the important areas is uh, uh, agriculture mechanization. Obviously, Laos is a very low mechanized uh, country in terms of agriculture, and as we uh, as we implement uh, the new uh, sustainable agriculture policy, actually, uh, obviously, um, mechanization me needs to increase. But does this mechanization have to be based on uh, combustion engines on fossil fuels? Um, this is the big question. There's a lot of research going on on sustainable mechanization, which uh, looks at battery powered um, machinery for the farm, but also looks at uh, a um, generating energy on the farm. So the farm, the, the energy that would be needed on the farm to be generated on the farm as well. Um, green extension upskilling, I mentioned that, and the third one would be green markets and value chains. So it's sort of a, uh, uh, that sort of rounds up um, and extends from just looking at uh, green production systems. Um, so this is sort of the flow chart that, uh, the, 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 that the government has in mind um, from current conditions, using current conditions, not only as sort of, uh, oh, this is a, you know, a Develop least developing country. Um, there's a ton of problems. Yes, there are a ton of problems, but there are also a ton of opportunities and a ton of strengths that uh, we can build on. And by uh, focusing on these investment areas, we will hopefully have uh, greener and more sustainable outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clements. Fascinating presentation um, and uh, reminding us that um, not everybody is necessarily on the cusp of a traditional industrialization path, but there are tremendous opportunities nonetheless for innovation, uh, for moving into higher value added products, um, uh, specialty products, for example, that don't compete with the mass market rice of uh, Vietnam and uh, Thailand and China f and uh, and so on. It's really fascinating. Um, so I'm looking to see if there are questions here. Um, maybe somebody can help me out. My uh, chat box function is a little bit uh, temperamental at the moment. Okay. So yeah, there Michelle, is a question. Michelle Scobie. Thanks, Clemens. This is amazing. Definitely developing GSA. Yeah, it's a quite impressive framework. Just wondering how this works with the SDGs on poverty. Do you have examples of how individual farmers were lifted out of poverty towards higher quality living education with this system? It seems like it's still in the early days of development, but please, can you answer that for Michelle and others? I'll try. Um, and maybe using, uh, since uh, Santiago talked about coffee a lot, I'll, I might also talk about coffee. Um, and, at the moment, um, because of a sort of poor uh, policy framework and also implementation, uh, a lot of the um, uh, Lao coffee, even though it is high quality coffee, Arabica uh, and Liberica coffee, um, it is bought up by Vietnamese uh, uh, traders and mixed in with uh, lower quality Vietnamese coffee, uh, <laughs> which is usually of the robusta variety and then exported as Vietnamese coffee, okay? Um, so, so the idea uh, of the new strategy would be uh, to identify Lao coffee as Lao coffee, as high quality specialty coffee that uh, is geo-indexed, comes from that region and therefore would fetch a higher price. Obviously the, um, the, the Vietnamese trader want to make a uh, a living as well, so they buy up uh, the coffee at a very low rate and then sell it on as Vietnamese coffee. So um, by directly accessing the producers uh, in Laos and linking them up with uh, specialty markets that fetch a higher price um, of coffee, the idea would be that these these uh, value additions would directly benefit um, the producers who then in turn could uh, reinvest uh, those, uh, those benefits into their farms in order to up, up, uplift and upscale their, 
their their production systems. Thanks. Any follow on question? Uh, I have a question. Um, you mentioned, and it, it's quite an interesting and promising development that the Lao government is beginning to uh, ease up on allowing the private sector to do things, um, to partner with government, uh, probably at the outset. Um, I was just curious, um, you know, I, I've had experience in, in Vietnam in the past, um, and um, in that experience, maybe it's outdated now, um, the government's opening up to the private sector mostly meant that domestic entrepreneurs were to stay small, don't get too big, <laughs> but that foreign companies at any, of any size were welcome. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, is there a, you know, is there an effort to develop a domestic business sector that could also grow in size and become, you know, important suppliers to farmers, for example, or uh, processors of uh, farmers' products? Or is the government still trying to keep a tight control over domestic private sector development? So that's a really interesting question. Uh, um, I think that the, 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 the final answer to this question is, is not uh, apparent yet. So uh, as you well know, most of Laos's agriculture is based on smallholder farming um, at the moment. I think 90% of um, of uh, uh, farming in Laos is is smaller than uh, five hectare. So um, at the moment, these you know larger investments have not have not um, appeared yet. With again the exam uh, the exception of um, coffee, where there are uh, two larger companies uh, that are domestic um, that uh, that um, have have emerged. Uh, the, the largest being Dow Coffee, um, that that uh, um, uh, have control of all. I think almost a, a quarter of the entire production area of coffee in in Laos, and another quarter uh, of smallholders that um, that supply to this particular company. Um, so this is an example of that that it is possible. Uh, uh, in Laos, uh, as a as a domestic investor, to to go into larger uh, scale production, but uh, I think you know at the moment it's still very heavily controlled, and um, uh, you know that that uh, even these companies are are uh, very much dependent on the whims of the of the political decision makers. Okay. Um... Any other questions, or should I ask another one? You don't want to hear from, from me too much. Can it, anybody else jump in here with a question? Are there any I'm not seeing? Okay, let me, let, me just, let me ask one last question, and then we'll move to the summary uh, session. Um, you talk about you know green, green extension, and maybe you could elaborate a bit more on, on what that involves and, and what, not only in terms of you know the practices, but also how you um, train the trainer, train the extension workers uh, to be able to share knowledge on green practices. Um, you know, presumably that's not something that they necessarily have um, at hand, and, and some kind of a training exercise would be needed. Is that something that's envisaged or in process at this point? Sorry, David. Could, could you could you repeat your question? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you lost it all. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on the, the part of your your framework that involves green extension. And ah, yeah. Explain what it what it involves and how you actually can implement it. Given that I presume the existing extension workers have not been trained uh, yeah. very much in green extension practices technologies yeah i'm uh, I, i'm unfortunately not the uh, expert on that there's a large um uh project supported by um, uh, the swiss um, development agency sdc that looks particularly at um, green extension uh in Laos and and in some of the other countries as well i think myanmar um 
but but essentially it involves uh, a lot of it, it involves uh, a lot of research and testing uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, looking at what what types of production systems are suitable to what types of conditions and what types of sort of uh, uh, skill levels uh, um, and, and, you know, other conditions. Um, uh, so that that's one thing. The other thing is that um, it, it kind of also involves a, a, a mind shift. I think I was talking about that before, that um, moving away from this um, focus on productivity and on production growth uh, mm -hmm. towards a, a more balanced approach uh, and 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 a focus on perhaps uh, also resource conservation um, and um, and I think also you know looking at looking at the potential for innovation so one of the big things in the uh, green extension program is is uh, building on local knowledge and indigenous knowledge so looking at those areas, to uh, to come up with new niche and specialty products that might be might have been in the Lao diet for uh, centuries perhaps, but could also be interesting for uh, other other uh, other markets overseas. So it's 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 a, it's a lot of different uh, elements that that um, that that come together here. Great, great, thank you. There's uh, another my, question. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, does a change of government affect the direction of government policy? Um, I don't know that there's such a thing as a change of government in Laos, but, uh, but that's a question from Michelle Scobie. Does a change of government affect the direction of government policy on GSA? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, um, I think the, you know, uh, the SDGs have been, have been um, absorbed into the National Socioeconomic Development Plan, the last one and the coming one this year. Um, and and the, I mentioned that there is a national green growth strategy. Now there's a, a green and sustainable agriculture strategy. So these things are not... Um, like small little policies that change, uh, uh, you know, in a matter of months or years. But these are longer term policies, which uh, really set uh, Laos uh, in a direction towards more sustainability. I think there is a an understanding at all levels of government that um, a more sustainable form of uh, production and as well as consumption is needed for Laos, but is also an opportunity for Laos. So. Um, even if there was a change in government, I don't see that this would um, this would really affect sort of the 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 the, the, the direction of the country towards more um, sustainability. And and really, um, they actually also um, get a sense of pride um, from these new policies because, like in the example of the green sustainable agriculture policy, it it, it puts um, Laos in the forefront of uh, sort of sustainable sustainable agriculture policies within ASEAN. So it's something that they can show off with, uh, uh, be a pioneer in this area, and uh, other countries coming to learn uh, from Laos on what to do about, uh, you know, about, about transforming production systems. Uh, so, so yeah, there is cross-partisan support, and, and this is very much supported by uh, the, the, the uh, the international community, the donors, um, as well as, uh, you know, the UN organizations and the research institutes such as SEI. So I think there's a good direction and uh, there's good momentum going on in Laos at the moment. Great, great. So we have a, an example of healthy competition amongst countries to yeah. show their credentials in the green uh, agriculture area that's fantastic okay so let's move now to our summing up by our colleague and rapporteur mr Com foy thank you all uh profusely for this uh panel and for your presentations really appreciate it okay Com, you have the floor thank you welcome to the worst part of my day this has been fascinating and very intense and extremely dense and complex i've enjoyed uh, every minute of it even if i was furiously writing away most of the time trying to take notes to uh, to do a proper report 
of course, now I've got something like 90 seconds to sum up two hours of, <laughs> of extremely interesting stuff. Um, again, this is the uh, this is the fourth day of the forum, and the forum's been fascinating all the way through. And as usually, it turns out differently from the way we expected. I'm not saying it turns out badly; it turns out well. Uh, today, however, was kind of more what we were expecting, and I was very very happy about that. We moved from uh, and in fact, I should say, this is one of the most real life experiences that we've had in the forum so far, from Lafarge talking about uh, most extraordinary developments in technology of cement and, and manufacturing materials and construction materials, all the way down to printing a house on a, on a, a printer, which seems to me just a kind of crazy idea. But um, I understand more what the process involves now, and I, and I think that this kind of a contribution to the quality of people's lives in places like Sub-Saharan Africa is an absolutely magnificent step forward, especially if it can, do, it can be done in a, as sustainable way as possible. And the, the sustainability question, which of course is our guiding light motif for this whole forum, indeed for the office itself, takes us to Chile. Um, and what we learned there that was really fascinating was the intensity of minerals in, in building our new and better, cleaner future. Uh, I don't think any of us had quite realized uh, the importance of, uh, of minerals in that future. But of course, we've all seen the images of the, uh, the damage that mining can be done, and it's very important to understand that there are going to be trade-offs, and those trade-offs were outlined very well by by Chris, who, who by Nick, sorry, who uh, who said things we could all very very much relate to about people being worried about new technologies losing them jobs and ruining their environments and so on, and what an uphill job it's going to be. Um, but it's a job that seems to have been understood and is is now being undertaken uh, in Chile and the, and in the rest of the Andean region. And then we move uh, very quickly from there to agriculture. Uh, and again, another fascinating uh, presentation from IDRC, which I, I know from having worked with IDRC, actually. Uh, this, uh, this connection between research and the real world, which is actually the huge value added of IDRC, um, very well demonstrated by the link uh, between climate change and crop change and the need to adapt. And I, the, the big message I took out of that was this idea of resilient communities, which uh, we talk a lot about resilience to climate change, but we rarely relate it to communities and agriculturally based communities at that, as well as the agro industry, finding new products, finding new markets, finding green, way, green ways of doing things, which um, in, a, in an agricultural context seems somewhat paradoxical. And then finally, I'm sorry to have to go so far, uh, we learned about uh, what's going on in the uh, uh, LPDR, the Large, Large People's Democratic Republic, which, uh, again, amazing, a, a kind of 90 degree turn, recognizing that things were not going the way they were planned, that the planning was wrong in the first place, and then doing something to try to, to, to correct the errors and to do so in a sustainable way. Uh, really excellent work being done uh, there. Uh, by um, by the team, and uh, I'm going to be looking through the slides again because there was so much information in there, and Clemens had to go so quickly that uh, there's an awful lot that I'm sure that I've missed. But the, the the GSA and the emphasis on sustainability and green growth uh, really very welcome, and it's nice to see something like that in practice. And as David said right at the end, uh, it's nice to see countries competing with each other to be greener than their neighbours. So thank you all very, very much. Um, I will remind you in parting that uh, the final session is tomorrow. You're very welcome to join that session. It's on the circular economy, so I don't know if Nick will uh, have much to, <laughs> to say about that, having his uh, remarks on the subject uh, just a few moments ago. Um, but it's a very, very good topic to finish with. And uh, you're very, invi very, very much invited to join us. And thank you very, very much for the presentations you've done this morning. And I apologize for the poverty of my summary. Enjoy your day, your evening, and your night. David. Yeah. Oh.
Thank you. Uh, yeah, we're going to pass it now to Jean D'Aragon, but we just want to acknowledge the thanks from some of the audience. Sophie Morgan Center, thanks for the excellent presentations and others as well. And I'd like to thank the participants for their involvement. Uh, but now I pass it to Jean D'Aragon for final observations from the UN Office for Sustainable Development. Thank you uh, very much, uh, David. Thank you, um, Paul. Now, uh, actually, if my only observation, I want to, to say, well, good evening and afternoon and morning to everyone, to the participants. But uh, um, I can't believe that it's already the fourth uh, day or the fourth session of the, the forum that is over, uh, that it went very fast. And tonight, I think it went very even faster. I think it was very fascinating. Uh, the, this uh, uh, session on building uh, local sustainable low carbon agro processing structured material industries. I'd like to thank the speakers Antonio Carillo, uh, Nicolas Milling, Santiago Alba Oral, and uh, Clemens Grunberg. Uh, thank you all for your excellent uh, presentations. And of course, I'd like to do to uh, thank also uh, moderator David Bonner and the Confoy uh, reporter. And again, uh, the attendees, the participants, and the UN, I'd like to recognize also the work of the UN OSD staff and interns uh, who are working hard. We don't see them, we don't hear them, but uh, if we don't hear them and don't see them, it's because everything goes smoothly. So this is, uh, I'd like to thank them. And of course, I'd like to invite again people to join us tomorrow for this uh, last session on moving to zero waste, circular economies, which we touched upon a bit tonight, but uh, tomorrow will be more um, deeply uh, touched upon and discussed. Thank let you me, very let much me just, again. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, let me just come in and say that we also have a strong endorsement of Combs summing up by Lucia in uh, Switzerland. So thank you for that. Great, okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Lucia. <laughs> so, uh, okay, th th so thank you very much, everyone, and then uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, okay, thank you, one and all. Ciao, ciao. Bye, everybody. Thank you again. Bye, everybody. Thank you.